Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Sunday's edition of Alaska Weather. I'm Dave Percy. On the hazardous warning graphic, we've got wind advisories out uh, <clears throat> for until Tuesday morning here for the Alaska Range, uh, looking for gusts to six or as high as 50 miles per hour, maybe 55 at times, or 40 to 55 miles an hour in gusts through the passes, and also wind advisories here for the uh, Upper Tanaw Valley 40 mile country. Could see winds uh, 15 to 25, maybe gusts 35 to 40 miles an hour in that area. And the same thing up here for the Upper Yukon Valley, Fort Yukon, Chuck Yitzik, Beaver, those locations, especially higher elevations, uh, could see gusts to 40 miles an hour. And that's out uh, later tonight and through the day tomorrow and tomorrow night until early Tuesday morning. Also, a flood advisor or a flood watch remains out for the uh, Seward area there for the Seward River or the Resurrection River, mainly in the Seward area. And uh, that's out from this evening, Sunday evening. And that's also out through Monday night or into Tuesday, early Tuesday for uh, possible minor flooding there in the low lying areas around Seward and the airport. And moving on to satellite imagery, <clears throat> here's the uh, storm bringing the heavy rain into uh, areas today. 24-hour uh, amounts, which uh, mostly back to the west occurred earlier in the 24-hour period, such as uh, one and a half inches falling at Chignik. Uh, for example, Kodiak uh, earlier on before the front, which has already moved through, they picked up two and a half inches of rain in the last 24 hours. And that's again really tapered off this afternoon, as you can see, maybe a few breaks showing up here behind that front before more moisture already pushing more rain into the Alaska Peninsula on the south side there. Uh, Eric Yartini Bay had about three and a third inches of rain, as well as the southern Kenai Peninsula measuring about three and a third inches falling and uh, rain spreading up into Prince William Sound over to Cordova or over to uh, Valdez, but not quite to Cordova. And then across uh, even uh, eastern Cook Inlet, Kenai Anchorage reporting some rain today, but heavier over on the west side. And uh, rainfall amounts not quite as heavy here, anywhere from five hundredths to maybe a third of an inch falling across the uh, Yukon Cuscombe Delta areas, with rain pushing up uh, across eastern Norton Sound to the southern uh, peninsula there, mostly east of Nome. And otherwise, uh, the next front out here to the west, you can see. Uh, not all that impressive looking, kind of weakening and breaking up a little bit here as it pushes eastward and another batch of moisture behind that just exiting Shimia. Otherwise, over the southeast coast, uh, pretty nice conditions today. As you can see, uh, high pressure both the surface and aloft, uh, making for uh, some sunshine there with uh, temperatures warming in the 70s down south and not too bad up in the north with just some mid and high level clouds that's kind of uh, skirting the northern areas. And there's the high pressure ridge at the surface here right off the coast, uh, mostly sunny over the interior areas and warm. And again, this front bringing the uh, rain that's changed over to showers or ended there for Kodiak Island, most of Kodiak Island, southwest and northeast. And the heavy rain, southern Kenai Peninsula, moderate amounts of rain, upslope areas of the Alaska Range, specifically the eastern slopes, western Cook Inlet, and then rain back across the uh, Yukon Delta. Uh, starting to end over the Cusquam Delta with a front pushing northward and rainfall spreading up across uh, eastern Norton Sound there to the uh, eastern or southeast part of the Seward Peninsula and the Lotto Hills. Clouds to the east, uh, maybe a few breaks over the eastern upper Yukon Valley. And uh, trough uh, brought a little bit of moisture, very light precipitation to Kaktovik and Barter Island earlier today. That's now moved off to the east there. And generally, just a cloudy day with uh, no reports of fog this afternoon anywhere along the Arctic coast and not too bad over the north slope. And then the front out here to the west, uh, not all that strong, definitely not the wind producer that this system originally was, the main low center with this system. Still hanging back down off the chart, another weak one, uh, kind of redeveloped, uh, not all that strong, just a 1,007 millibars. 
that's sort of linked up or hooked up to the uh, frontal boundary here that's tracked northward. And that'll continue to move northward tonight. You can see that weak 1007 millibar low brings a chance of moisture to St. Lawrence Island and the Seward Peninsula. The front uh, looks like the southern slopes of the western Brooks Range. You'll see the greatest rainfall amounts, maybe half an inch overnight tonight. Lighter amounts on the north side. And then the uh, precipitation band really breaking up here off to the east and into the uh, Tanana Valley. But then those wind advisories kicking in for the uh, eastern zones here. Upper Tanana Valley, 40 Mile Country, Upper Yukon Valley, and the uh, Brooks or the Alaska Range for those uh, gusty winds through the passes. But the southern portion of the front keeping a fair amount of rain going, gradually shifting eastwards to look for lighter rainfall amounts, diminishing rain. Kenai Peninsula on the south side, western Prince William Sound. And uh, chance of rain there along eastern Kodiak Island with this next warm front spreading moisture northward. And the heaviest rain now, Valdez, Cordova, but still staying west of Yakutat, strong high pressure, surface and loft, holding this back to the west as best it can, at least for a little while longer. And uh, mostly fair there, low clouds fog possible along the coast, out to the west, the next Bering Sea front. Uh, getting pushed eastward here by uh, divergent southwesterly flow. So it's starting to stretch apart here. As you can see, the uh, flow kind of turning west-northwest in this area and southwest up to the north. So that's tending to stretch this out a little bit. So a narrow band of rainfall, light rain and fog will push into the Pribilofs and uh, won't, won't make it to St. Lawrence Island, but will move uh, to Atka this evening and then toward Nikolsky toward morning as it improves over ADAC but more uh, windy and showery conditions pushing in the far western areas. And then for tomorrow, you can see this frontal boundary doesn't move too much up there to the north, just continues to weaken. Look for uh, areas of light rain, clouds, and showers over along the Brooks Range, not so much in the upper Yukon Valley. Then it looks like from about Eagle southward along the frontal boundary, better chance of seeing some measure of precipitation there down into the northeast Copper River Basin. Moderate amounts of rain continue there for Cordova, eastern Prince William Sound, trying to spread in toward Yakutat late in the day. Sunny warm conditions in the forecast here for the southern panhandle, or actually the entire panhandle with temperatures approaching 80 down to the south. Numerous showers in the west, but not much in the way of any windy conditions at all. In fact, they look pretty light, and that weakening front makes for a uh, Cloudy, damp day Monday for the Eastern Aleutians and Pribilof Islands. And then for Tuesday, that uh, original front just kind of uh, breaks into a series of troughs with the upper level low in this position. So lots of showers and unsettled conditions, cool over the southwest interior. General band of rain through the uh, central interior here over to the main low center, just east of uh, the border there down into the, up, or the Copper River Basin. Now the heavier rain, that front finally getting shoved through the northern panhandle there. So definitely looking, even in the south, looking for about 10 degrees of cooling for your temperatures Tuesday afternoon. Lows tonight in the 40s and 50s, just about everywhere, except the eastern Arctic coast in the 30s. Highs tomorrow, let me back up, near 80, southern panhandle, lower 70s in the north, even near 70 along the coast, 70s central eastern interior, 60s lower to mid south central Alaska, 40s on the Arctic coast, and 50s out over the Bering Sea and the Aleutians. Lows the following morning, 30s here from the Brooks Range out to the Arctic coast, 50s and 40s over the interior, and uh, mid 50s over the southern panhandle, but that front coming in only near 70 down south, lower 60s to the north, 60s over the interior, and near 40 along the Arctic coast. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. Flying weather showing IFR all of the Arctic coast through the Chukchi Sea here through the Bering Strait, St. Lawrence Island, south side of the Seward Peninsula there, as well as into the Yukon Delta, then a narrow band down across the Perbolofs to Unmak Island. VFR, ATCA, IFR, ADAC, and marginal VFR for Shimia. Otherwise, uh, most of Kodiak VFR with some IFR up to the uh, south coast of the Kenai Peninsula, western Prince William Sound, maybe Cape Yakutaga VFR for the Panhandle and eastern interior. For the afternoon, VFR holds here for the uh, all the Tana Valley, 40 mile country into the upper Yukon Valley until you get to the eastern Brooks Range and then along the south side of the mountains there. Marginal VFR all the way out to the northwest coast. VFR for the north slope, IFR for the central eastern Arctic coast. And a lot of IFR here now for the Gulf of Alaska, up across Prince William Sound to the coast range, into the south and east side of the Kenai Peninsula. It looks like VFR here for Cook Inlet until you get over toward the Alaska Range and back to marginal. And this narrow band of IFR out here with that uh, frontal boundary 
from just south of St. Lawrence Island into the eastern Aleutians and more IFR pushing into the far western Aleutians. That will expand and continue to move east-northeast for Tuesday morning with uh, this original band starting to dissipate here with marginal VFR up to the southwest coast, Bristol Bay, marginal northern interior, northern valleys there of the uh, Kobuk Koyukuk on up till you get IFR along the central eastern Arctic coast. A lot of IFR persisting here over the Gulf of Alaska and uh, staying pretty decent there, but uh, marginal along the, south, along the coast of the Panhandle. And for the afternoon, now you're getting some marginal VFR into the northern areas with uh, even an increase there along the coast of uh, lower conditions, marginal across the Gulf to the Kenai Peninsula, basically VFR through the central interior from uh, Norton Sound and uh, Kotzebue, Seward Peninsula eastward. Then from the Brooks Range on out to the Arctic coast, pretty marginal IFR here, slowly advancing eastward. Looks like, uh, well, overtaking the Perloffs, IFR day on Tuesday there, down to about Nikulski, back to Adak. Passes shaping up like this tomorrow, both Anatovic and Attigan will be marginal. And for the uh, Lake Clark Merrill Passes, same forecast, marginal VFR at times mostly, and for rainy, marginal, windy VFR, possible marginal VFR south entrance, and for Isabel, a marginal kind of day, and Mintasta VFR with possible marginal VFR there on the southern entrance, for Tanita VFR, Portage, uh, marginal VFR looks like uh, IFR though holding on the eastern entrance there, and then for the uh, Chilkoot and White passes another at least one more VFR day. And for the freezing level, 6,000 feet here, kind of a cool pocket aloft there over the yukon Cuscombe Delta, otherwise 8,000 feet, uh, 12 to 14,000 feet under upper high pressure here for the eastern Gulf and Panhandle, 8,000 feet uh, all the way up toward the Arctic coast, and another warm wedge here pushing northward, 12,000 feet well into the, toward the northern Bering Sea. And for icing, with the uh, southerly flow, slowly shifting eastward, but not too fast up against that ridge. Still a lot of south to north flow for considerable moderate rime icing here. Uh, above about uh, oh, 10, 9,000, 10, 10,000 feet for the North Gulf Coast, and then above about 6,000 feet of just isolated moderate up here over the northwest. And for the jet stream, there's that big upper ridge holding here over the eastern Gulf of Alaska and dominating the weather for the panhandle with uh, Temperatures again tomorrow approaching 80 degrees in the southern areas. Otherwise, south to north flow pretty strong here, 130 knots uh, between the cooler air aloft and the much warmer air aloft there with that ridge. So southerly is up to 130. Turn northeast, come down to about 100 knots through the interior and a 9,000 feet. Uh, south to southeast winds, 20 to 35 knots here. Western Gulf of Alaska, Kodiak up in across the Kenai Peninsula. And then about 15 to 20 or 25 up over the interior out west, big upper low back out over the western bearing. Southwesterly is 40 to 50 approaching the uh, western Aleutians, about 30 in the central Aleutians, and then much weaker along this trough axis approaching the southwest coast. 3,000 foot winds, southerly is 25 up along the southwest coast of Novak Island. 5 to 15 for the most part Brooks Range out to the Arctic coast of 20 knots on the east side, 40 knots for the western Aleutians, and 25 coming into the North Gulf Coast. Turbulence looking like this, pretty smooth for the Panhandle. Uh, I, I, a considerable moderate chop for the Prince William Sound, Eastern Kenai Peninsula, and from the Barren Islands up into Kamishak Bay. And after the break, I'll be back with the marine forecasts. Welcome back to another edition of Alaska Weather Facts. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder, and joining me once again is Eric Stevens from the Geographic Information Network of Alaska, or GINA, based at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Eric, welcome back to the show. Well, Dave, it's great to be back. Thanks for inviting us again. Sure thing. And, and today we want to talk about identifying burn scars. That would be the, the burned up area after a wildfire when the flames and the smoke are gone. We can see it if you drive by it on the roadway, of course, but uh, from satellite, we can also identify those, uh, those places on the land, right? You know it. Um, you know that expression, ouch, that's going to leave a mark? Yeah. Uh, after you bang your knee uh, getting out of the car? You, oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, the ouch, it's going to leave a mark, that also applies to the landscape. Whenever a wildfire ravages through, it's going to leave a mark on mm -hmm. the landscape. After a wildfire burns out, this is called a burn scar. Okay. And you can ask yourself, well, that's interesting. We can see a burn scar from space. Right. Um, then the question is, well, why right. does that matter? Okay. Who cares? Yeah, fire's over. 
They're, right, the fire is over. We don't need to worry about this anymore. It turns out you kind of do, okay. because burn scars are important. Uh, there's this old rule of thumb in the weather business that flood follows fire. Okay. The action of the fire in, in killing off the vegetation, in baking, uh, kiln drying the landscape a little mm -hmm. bit, can hinder the land's ability to absorb rainfall. So if you have a fire, especially if it's in complex mountainous terrain. Right. This is classic in California. Mm -hmm. It can happen somewhat in Alaska too. You get a wildfire in, in steep hilly or mountainous terrain, rips off all the lands, or off the uh, vegetation off the landscape. Mm -hmm. Then six months later, there's a big rainstorm and you get a flash flood in that area. So right. flood can follow fire. That's why you gotta okay. know where the burn scars That's important. are. Secondly, a fire needs fuel to maintain itself. So mm -hmm. if there's an old burn scar left over from a year or two ago, and then another summer later here in Alaska in the interior, mm -hmm. it's a big wildfire season. If there's a fire advancing toward an old burn scar, well, guess what? That old burn scar is going to be tougher terrain for that new fire to get through because there's not right. as much fuel okay. in that burn scar. So they almost act like a natural fire break. These are a couple of reasons why you need to know where those burn scars are. Alaska Fire Service has limited resources. They want to put their people and their equipment sure. where it does the most good. They need to know, well, this is an area where there's no burn scar. We better put people here because that fire could really run. So That's really, we really important for uh, weather forecasters and fire weather forecasters for sure. Oh, yeah. But then how do we weather satellites actually detect those burn scars? Ah, good question. Thanks. Well, let's, let's turn the Wayback Machine to the summer of 2015. That was okay. a very active year. We've got a picture here taken up in the White Mountains. This is uh, one of the fires in progress that summer, mm -hmm. and if you look real close, you can almost see Frodo throwing the ring into <laughs> right. the no kidding. volcano there, so that's uh, quite the vision. Well, let's look at a visible image. Here we are okay. in Alaska's interior. This is before the fires got out of the cage mm -hmm. in early summer of 2015. Let's zoom in to the western interior here. Again, this is a weather satellite image of visible light, what the right. human eye can see. Okay. We're into the middle reach of the Yukon Valley there in the western interior, Galena area. And this is just a beautiful visible day. Uh, nothing much going on. It's, it's early, it's in early June before the fires really yeah. got active. But then in 2015, the fires got loose, especially in that western interior. Right. Here's another image, mm -hmm. the same satellite pass okay. as that visible image, but now we're not quite looking at visible light. Very different. There's a slight change here. This image incorporates something called the veggie band. Okay. 0.86 micron wavelength. The micron's very tiny, yeah. but that wavelength responds to vegetation, the chlorophyll. So trees oh. and grasses reflect that part of the electromagnetic spectrum back to the satellite. And so the satellite sees that. When signal comes at that wavelength to the satellite, we know, ah, there's some vegetation growing there. This is great. You can identify coastlines so easily because you go from vegetation to water. Um, turns out if you have a burn scar, guess what? Mm. You've burned away the vegetation, so okay. that's going to show up. We're going to do a before, during, and after kind of look here. And so okay. we're looking at before. So in this image, we've got a lot of green out there. That's wonderful. Right. Another fun thing about this kind of imagery is you can see down in the Alaska Range in the southeast oh. corner of the image, it's blue. Yeah. That's glaciers and snow oh, in the course. mountains. Okay. So this is not really what the human eye can see. This mm -hmm. is a these wavelengths are beyond human vision, but we've, we've made them look certain colors. So the, the vegetation looks green. Now let's look at that same kind of satellite mm -hmm. uh, recipe, but during the fires. This is in July. The fires are loose. You can see the smoke in the middle of the image, the smearing look of the smoke. And then we can see some clouds that are white. Uh, icy yeah. clouds are blue. So this is in July of 2015. The fires are doing their thing. We're okay. burning up millions of acres. Now let's go to September. The fires are out. The audience has left the theater. You know, the event's over, right? right. We're done. But guess what? Now look at those brown oh, patches. All of those places are where the fire has burned away the vegetation. So you can see where the fire is where you can add the, up these perimeters, get acreage burned mm -hmm. and such. And so that's good to know. Now remember, flood follows fire, and yeah. these are also natural fire breaks. So you need to know where these guys are. In the course of the 2015 summer season, we went from before with not much burn scar in this area to just a couple months later, we can see so much burn scarring on the landscape. What's interesting, wow. too, about the satellite and looking at burn scars is you, you realize that burn scars are the gift that keeps on giving. Uh -huh. You can forget that a couple of years ago, maybe there was a fire in a certain area, but the satellite won't forget. So in the summertime, we get wildfires in Alaska, but guess what? Um, in, the, in the visible imagery here, we can see the burn scars just a little bit. 
but they're not as prominent as in that veggie band. But then you can't see them at all if you cover them up with snow, right? right. Exactly. So here's exactly. an image okay. from the middle of the oh, winter time. Wow. And snow on the ground by this, this recipe mm -hmm. looks blue. Again, these are wavelengths of light that the human eye can't really see. We're getting up into the infrared, near infrared. And the way we've assigned colors is if there's snow on the ground or there's a glacier, it looks blue, kind of intuitive. So this is uh, early April of the following year, 2016. Okay. We're just about to get into breakup. We've got a lot of snow on the ground. It's now it's all going to melt. And as the snow melts, then you get our final image here. Mm -hmm. Doesn't this look familiar? This looks like a lot of what we saw in September okay. of the previous summer. So this mm -hmm. is the spring of the next year. Okay. These, the fires themselves might not have overwintered. They're gone, but the right. fire scar does. Yep. And as the snow melts away, and then we have, you have breakup, and then you have green up, uh -huh. when every, the leaves come out, the grass comes back, except in the burned areas, they're having a tough time because everything got burned off the previous year. So you can see these scars even sure. the next summer, multiple years. It depends on how, what kind of vegetation there is. You know, mm -hmm. some of the tussocky tundra grasses, they'll grow back really quick. But to get a, a forest to come back, that'll take much longer. So these burn scars, eventually the, the landscape will, will fill in the burn scar. It will heal itself, if you want to use that metaphor. Mm -hmm. But uh, for the next few years, you can still keep track of these on satellite. And again, the reason we want to do that is that uh, the burn scar can facilitate a flood right. and it can act like a, a fire break. So there you are. The Fascinating veggie band. tools. So if you're a weather satellite and you're looking at my uh, bowl of vegetables here, you might be able to pick out which one's the pea, which one's the tomato, and which one's the carrot and, and apply that information. Uh, precisely to whatever it is you're, you're working on there. That is really fascinating stuff that we have that capability from so high above the planet Earth, and right. Alaska for that matter. Yep. Eric, Eat your veggies. Yes, definitely. I think I will. I'm hungry. Thanks so much for joining us again, Eric, and thank you for joining us for another edition of Alaska Weather Facts. We'll see you right here next time. And now, marine weather around Alaska. Welcome back. Looking at today's sea ice analysis, uh, really no change actually from what we had up here yesterday. Still uh, the heavier ice hanging in close on the eastern Beaufort Sea coastline and now a fair distance off the central coast and uh, actually probably thinning a little bit through here, but uh, not as fast as north of that area of ice. And same trend for the next uh, five or six days of just a slow thaw of conditions. Coastal water forecast, south coast of the Panhandle, northwest, 10 to 15, seas 8 feet tomorrow. Otherwise, south to southeast, 15 to 20 on the north coast, south 20 Lynn Canal. Light northerlies for Stevens Passage, northwest 15, there for Clarence Strait. Outlook for Tuesday. South to southwest, 15 to 20 here on the southern, Pan southern coast, 7 to 8 foot seas. Small craft advisories on the north coast, 25 knots, 10 foot seas from the south southwest, south 30 knots there. Again, that uh, front pushing in to the northern areas as winds increase along with the rainfall and cooling temperatures. Southeast 15, uh, Stevens Passage, light southeast winds for Clarence Strait. North Gulf Coast, uh, still have small craft advisories tomorrow here for the eastern North Gulf Coast. Southeast 25, seas 12 feet, east 20 for Prince William Sound, four foot seas. Uh, lighter winds here, 15 knots, but seas still at 10 feet for the western coast. And the Barren Islands, southeast 15, turning east of 15, Kamishak Bay. And north to northeast at only 10 knots for Cook Inlet. And for Tuesday, southwest 20 knots south of the Forelands there, west 15 Kamishak Bay. Pick up a little bit to 20 knots, same direction over the Barrens. Small craft advisories, western north Gulf Coast, west 25, and southwest 20 for the east side and south 15 there in Bristol Bay. And for Kodiak, uh, southeast 15 there on the east side of the island, northeast 15 for Shelikoff Strait. And Sitkanak uh, to Castle Cape, southeast 20, east 20, Bristol Bay, east 15 for the Alaska Peninsula. For Tuesday, west 15 here from Cape Sarachev all the way up to Sitkanak, turning southwest of 15, east side of Kodiak, southwest 20 for Shelikoff Strait, 15 knots for Bristol Bay, picking up to 20 knots again uh, down toward or the uh, north side of the, of the Alaska Peninsula. Eastern Aleutians tomorrow, uh, basically south or southwest. 15 knots uh, on the light side there, 4 to 8 foot seas, west 20 for the Adak Atka area. And uh, coming up to 30 knots there, uh, definitely a high end wind forecast for the western Aleutians. Uh, 
Maybe minimum gales possible out here farther to the west, but uh, 30 knots, pretty good forecast, 17 foot seas. And that holds through Tuesday with those 30 knot winds and actually uh, that next front. Uh, stay strong enough to produce small craft advisories here for the central and eastern Aleutians from the south at 20 to 30 knots with seas running 8 to 12 feet. Southwest coast uh, tomorrow, southeast 20 to 25 knots, southeast 20 St. Matthew Island, south 15 for the Purple Off, south 20 for uh, Norton Sound, southeast 20 for St. Lawrence Island with 5 foot seas. And for Tuesday, east uh, for St. Lawrence Island 20 knots, south to southwest 15 along the coast, and south 25 for the Purple Offs and uh, St. Matthew Island east at 20, Norton Sound uh, northeast and only 15 knots and seas with about 3 feet. And for the uh, eastern Beaufort Sea coast, easterlies 15 to 20 or so, and uh, 20 knot winds on the central coast pick up uh, by the time you get to Point Lay there at that latitude. And there'll be 25 knots down to Cape Beaufort, Cape Beaufort to Cape Thompson, south 15, Cape Thompson to Wales, southeast 15 with seas running 3 feet. For Tuesday, south 20 knots, Wales on up to Cape Thompson, Cape Thompson, Cape Beaufort, east 20, 7 foot seas, east 30 knots on the uh, western, central, and eastern Arctic coast. So a little windier day coming up on Tuesday up there with uh, sea 6 to 7 feet and 25 knot winds. So brisk wind advisories here on the eastern stretch of the coastline. For tonight, this uh, slow moving front, uh, rainfall not quite as heavy, slowly diminishing in the intensity, and, uh, but staying pretty good there due to slow movement. We see a fair amount of rain northeast to Prince William Sound, Cordova, but not quite making it to Yakutat, up into the Wrangell Mountains, breaking up quite a bit here, not in the, uh, very diffuse areas of precipitation from the Alaska Range on up to the Brooks Range, a little bit more back here to the northwest. Showers scattered around the central and southwest interior. Next front pushing rain uh, slowly in toward the eastern Aleutians. Drier for Kodiak, break for Bristol Bay, and then uh, numerous showers here over the western interior due to upper low pressure. Main front still edging its way eastward. It'll bring some rain maybe into Yakutat late in the day. Nice sunny and warm day for the southeast coast, 70 to 80 for the highs, and the next day look for 10 degrees cooling or more, especially down south with rain. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbormaster before you go boating. Thank you.